Christmas, everybody. Here we are at our final regular season episode of Film Revision, the 25th film from 1983 that we will have discussed this year. And what better way to close out our year with, than with the film that pretty much swept the Academy Awards that year, winning Best Actress, Best Supporting Actor, Best Director, and of course, Best Picture of the Year. In addition to that, it is one of the more culturally pervasive films that we will be discussing this year. It remains resonant in the minds of many filmgoers, and that's something I would like to get into a little bit over the course of the discussion today. I refer to, of course, Terms of Endearment, directed by James L. Brooks. And to discuss Terms of Endearment with us today is another one of our stars from our upcoming web serial intersection, actor Stephen Ott from Woodside, Queens. And also, executive assistant Heather Overton from Kingsville, Texas. Heather, you're up first. I think it's the saddest movie ever. I mean, I just think that the relationship between Deborah Ringer and Shirley MacLaine is so strong that, uh, I mean, I don't know, I just really related to like the mother-daughter relationship and just found it really moving. It was pretty sad. The story was a little bit hard for me to penetrate at times. I felt like there were pieces missing. I thought there were things that were unclear about uh, the mother-daughter relationship and about the marriage, certainly. Well, since we're gonna talk about the saddest movie ever, I should probably lose the, the Santa hat. <laughs> so anyway, I have big, big problems with this movie and, I, and I'm confused as to uh, its success uh, it's a, to me, a divisive film. It's a disjointed film. You call it the saddest movie ever, which is interesting because director James Brooke calls it a comedy. That, to me, points to two real big things. Number one, to me, is tone. When you want to say tone in terms of endearment, what do you think of? Uneven. There were moments that were funny, but there were so many moments where you're watching these very flawed people lead their lives. And it was interesting, I thought, that we were able to really see and experience those flaws. But at the same time, I was finding it hard to grasp onto a clear storyline that I was supposed to feel something about. Like I was laughing out loud through the whole movie, and then, but I think the thing like at the end, it just gets you. I mean, I think it's a really funny movie. Well, I mean, I think it wanted to be funny. For three quarters of the movie, it's this very contrived, stagey, sitcom, slapstick sense of humor. Like I think about the moment that Shayla McLean, she's peeking out the window at Jack Nicholson and she falls off her chair. I mean, like, you know, and there's, there's other moments like that. He, he's dumping out the garbage and he misses it and he falls out of a, a Camaro. Or, these moments don't feel genuine. I mean, like, the, they work in a sitcom because of the pace of a sitcom, it's 30 minutes long. On the big screen, it falls flat, at least to me, because it doesn't feel real. Each scene is shaping towards a joke instead of an emotion. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you on that. I would probably disagree with that. You I would. Mean, I, Bring yeah. it on. <laughs> I think maybe the first few scenes, like the scene where she's, like, smoking with her friend in the, in the bed, like, I think those first few scenes kind of felt more sitcom but I felt like after the marriage, like, when they moved to Des Moines, it felt more real after that point. And that's really kind of when I got more connected to the story. I felt like there was this mysterious thing that kept kind of running away from us during the film, you know? Like, I wanted to know why they were both unfaithful to each other. The marriage to you was, was a narrative hole. I couldn't tell whether it was that I had missed something or... I agree, I don't feel like the information's there to really like root for these characters. On my part, I did still want to know, which I guess a lot of films you see that are like that, you're just like, I oh, forget it, you know, I don't yeah, want to watch this up. anymore. But I really wanted to know. Aurora says in the beginning, she says you're not special enough to escape, what's like? Ooh, subtextual foreshadowing. Yeah, I mean, so it was like, you know that she, the, the marriage, I mean, I wasn't surprised. I didn't feel like I was missing anything with, you know, with their marriage. The nature of their problems is is never really fully explored. Right? They're a pretty good married couple, he's pretty obedient, then all of a sudden she's pregnant with her child and, and he's not. And that aspect of his character is never established or any sort of hints of problems in their marriage aside from Rora. And that I think feel like that doesn't count because that's cheating. That's like a character saying, predicting something that actually winds up happening. We never see where that comes from. It was wild watching Sh Shirley MacLaine. She was this broad, larger than life character and I know larger than life people. So at times I was, like wanting to know and, and see more from her. There were other moments I just was like, oh. It is a great character. I, I don't feel Fairly like her me, performance you know. is as detailed as say Deborah Winger's, and yet, but on, at the same time, Deborah Winger has, has a lot more false moments. I think the difference is Deborah Winger, you know, being a little more methody, I think in, in practice, you know, was making a lot more choices and, and maybe got a few more wrong or, or did, did that weren't as effective. With that said, their mother-daughter dynamic was very, very detailed. You know, both from a direction point of view and an acting point of view. I didn't get the mother-daughter dynamic in this thing at all. Wow! I, I, that's a bold statement. Because, I mean, like, to me, that's the, that's the thread of the movie. I felt that Shirley, McCa Shirley MacLaine's performance in the beginning was so unlikable that I couldn't understand. Her character was unlikable. Right, right. I found her character so unlikable and extreme that I couldn't really Because she really boycotted buy. the wedding? Even that I could understand if I felt that she had given it some type of redeeming, like she regretted doing it or she regretted <laughs> being mean to her in some way. But I felt in the, in the beginning she was an unrepentant 
kind of crazy person. I mean, I completely disagree with what you said about the I mean, I was completely invested in them, and I totally, like, the scene that I thought was the best was when, um, right after she's, like, slept with Jack Nicholson, and, and Deborah Winger and her are laying on the bed talking about how she can't believe she feels like this. I mean, I thought that was, like, such a great moment. You know what's funny? I totally didn't. I thought it was, I thought it was really contrived, like, you know, the whole fan-fucking-tastic, and, you know, <laughs> and actually, I really think it's a false moment for her, because when she has trouble saying it at first, uh, it, I didn't buy that. And like the interlocking interlocking legs, it, it didn't feel real to me at all. Uh, they have a lot of moments that work. It's, it's funny that the moment that you think that work is one that I think that totally didn't. I really didn't like that scene. Oddly enough, I feel like the best performance of the film is the only one that wasn't nominated. I think Jeff Daniels is the only real on-the-nose performance to me. He's creating like this really fascinating character. He's not necessarily a likable character, and I think maybe that's why he got he didn't get nominated. Yeah, I was actually, I thought he was great in it. For Jeff Daniels to not to have not nominated, and for Jack Nicholson to fucking win, that blows me away. I thought Jack Nicholson was a joke. I don't believe there's any dimensions to him. He's, he's a one-trick pony. I feel the same way about a lot of his performances. I just felt like it was his... 18th variation on I'm Jack and you know I'm gonna sneer and be unreachable and weird and <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's true right do you feel like it's a feminist film I mean they definitely make a statement when she comes to New York which is an opposite statement of most of the films that we've seen right she, she's a housewife she is looked down upon because she is not a working woman it's, it's sort of the other side of the coin because a lot of these other films are about you know how a woman jumped into a man's world or, or, or something like that. The other thing that occurred to me about the feminism aspect of it is the irrational nature of the characters is also a far departure from other films of this year that, that were dealing with feminist issues. I don't want to say they're not strong women, but at the same time, I'll make a point that uh, in another James L. Brooks film, As Good As It Gets, where somebody says, how do you, how do you write women? And he says, I think of a man and take away accountability and reason. It applies to these female characters in this movie. I feel like that's, I don't want to say anti-feminist, but it's certainly counter to the other films that dealt with feminism that we've watched this year. Aurora, I mean, the fact that she keeps all the, until she you know, gets with Jack Nicholson, the fact that she keeps all these guys around, like, it's like she doesn't want to be alone, but she wants a sense of power. Uh, it's time for closing thoughts. Uh, I'd give it a nine. Their performance has made the movie for me, and uh, like seeing it, I remember crying a lot when I saw it. But like seeing it now, I, you know, it's still it's just it was, I just think it's a really moving film. I'd give it like a seven point five. It was a flawed film, but I think that what it strived for was still very important, and I thought that it achieved, though not consistently, I thought it achieved a lot. I give the film a six. There's so many flaws in this film to me. There's so many uh, weaknesses, and, and and the tonal issue is huge. The film I think is devoid of subtext altogether except maybe for Jeff Daniels in some places. It is manipulative. I didn't even talk about the music. The music's very problematic in this film. And at the same time, I, I balled. I was emotionally invested enough to ball. So I, I you know, I'm feel internally divided about this film. I'm afraid it's time to say farewell. Um, a very special thank you to Stephen Ott and Heather Overton for coming out to talk about Terms of Endearment. It is also time for me to tell you about Real 13 for the last time. Two days after Christmas, Real 13 will bring you the 1967 Best Picture Oscar winner in the heat of the night, starring Sidney Poitier right. and Rod Steiger, directed by a young Norman Jewison, followed by the Real 13 short that you will have voted on on real13.org, and then the indie is the sci-fi cult favorite Donnie Darko, with Jake Gyllenhaal in the titular role. Now that we've reached the end of the road and have finally discussed 25 films from 25 years ago, we have one more step to take in our journey, and that is to discuss the year as a whole. And we're going to do that in our extravaganza finale, in which we're going to talk about the best of 1983. We're going to bring back the guests that you chose with your views and your votes on YouTube as your favorites, and together we're going to name the best actor, actress, director, and picture of the year. So make sure to tune in to find out what we chose and who those surprise guests will be. The finale will be broken up into several videos that will start to appear on YouTube on the first of the new year. So be sure to keep an eye out. I'll see you then.